live. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year from Books and Books, your locally owned independent bookstore. And thank you for joining us tonight for our virtual author series event. Um, we love hosting these, but it's always extra special when we get to do it with one of our local authors. And tonight we uh, can. So today, Maika Mulit and Maritza Mulit, sophomore novel, one of the good ones, um, a follow up to their brilliant debut, Dear Haiti Love Elaine. I always say, Dear Elaine, love Haiti. <laughs> I love this book, um, this new book. I love Elaine, and I'm so, so, so excited to see this one launched into the world today. I hope everyone here has a copy if you haven't and gives it a read. Um, so a little bit about our authors tonight. Maika Mulit is a Miami native and the daughter of Haitian immigrants. She earned a bachelor's in marketing from Florida State University and an MBA at the University of Miami. When she's not using her digital prowess to help nonprofits and major organizations tell their stories online, she's sharpening her skills as a PhD student at Howard University's Communication, Culture, and Studies program. Her research focuses on representation in media and its impact on marginalized groups. She's the eldest of four sisters and loves young adult novels, fierce female leads, and laughing. Marissa Mouli graduated from the University of Florida with a bachelor's in women's studies and the of South, South California with a master's in journalism. She's worked in various capacities for NBC News, CNN, and Say Today. Maritza is a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, exploring ways to improve literacy in under-resourced communities after being in study education from her time as a literacy tutor and pre-K teacher assistant. Her favorite song, September by Earth, Wind & Fire. And our conversant tonight is Brad Meltzer, the number one New York Times bestselling author of Heroes for My Son, Heroes for My Daughter, a dozen suspense novels like The Escape Artist and nonfiction books like The First Conspiracy. He's also the host of the History Channel television shows, um, Brad Meltzer's Decoded and Brad Meltzer's Lost History, which he used to help find the missing 9-11 flag. And he's a co-creator of Xavier Riddle and the Secret Museum, and of course, the inspiration, inspiration for the character, Brad. He lives here in Florida with his wife and their three kids. Um, before I hand this over to Maika, Marissa, and Brad, a couple of things about your screen right now. Uh, the first is that the ask a question button on the bottom right is we're gonna use for the Q&A portion at the end. So if you want us to ask your question, please drop it there. Uh, things get lost in the chat. And then next to that, you'll see a little donate button if you're willing or able to help us keep to keep things going at Books and Books. And then of course, directly below us is the most important button of the night. My favorite button, the big green button. Um, this is where you can click to purchase your copy of one of the good ones by Maika and Maritza Mulit. And we will um, get it signed for you, ship, ship it. It can be for pick up at any of our locations. And if you would like it personalized, just leave us a note and we'll take care of that for you. As so thank you all again for joining us. And that's it for me. I'll see you in a little bit for the Q&A. Congratulations. Thank you, Christina. All right, we are live. Yes. Wait, I'm gonna do, so wait, I, wait, you can't wait. I'm going to do, this is going to be my introduction. And I want everyone who's watching, this is going to be key because you heard the stuff that's on the back of the book. You know what that is. Um, but I'm going to tell you my personal story of how I met these amazing sisters, Aika and Maritza, and this is how it goes, okay? 15 years ago, a handsome bald man, <laughs> who, right? Just like this. So here's what happens. So I get this. Um, I went to North Miami Beach Senior High School. Uh, our illustrious authors went to North Miami Beach Senior High School. Neither of us know each other at all. And years ago, they asked me to come and do an assembly because I write novels. We come talk to the students. And I said, sure. They said, can you donate some books? I was like, how many do you need? They were like 3,000. Like, that's like $30,000 worth of books. So I called the publisher. The publisher's like, for your old high school, we're going to do it. So we donate 3,000 books come in. And they tell me, like, yeah, we gave them to like the honors class. And I'm like, no one read these books. They must be like, truly like balancing tables and like being used as like PE footballs. I'm like, no one's reading it. <laughs> and then fast forward to two years ago, I get an email. And I do this assembly and I love the assembly and we have a great time. It's actually one of my favorite things. And two years ago, I get an email and it says, Dear Brad, uh, our names are Maika and Maritza and we went to North Miami Beach Senior High School and we were in the audience when you came to school 
And we just want you to know that when you were there, just as a real author, that an author really existed, it helped us believe that we could be authors ourselves, which is also something, I get emails from people who say like, hey, you know, I appreciate it, or I like, you know, you wrote a book, but they say the most important thing, they say also, and our book is coming out, they had done it, without me, without anyone, they did it all on their own, amazing. And I love that Dear Haiti Leveling is coming out, I was like, this is incredible. So I reached out to them. I wanted to actually do their last event at Books and Books. I wanted to surprise them that night. They didn't know this. I don't know if I ever told you this. Um, but I wanted to surprise you that night, and I couldn't that night because I forgot what was going on. Uh, but since that time, uh, they've become a, a vital part of my life. In fact, last year at the Miami Book Fair, put on, by, of course, by our beloved Books and Books, I, right before I went out to the book fair, I didn't know they were going to be there. They didn't know I was going to be there. And I said, you know what? I'm going to grab their book. And I took Dear Haiti Level Lane. I took it with me. And I said, I'm going to carry this book around all day because I want everyone to know. When they see me, I want them to know this is the best book they need to read. So I'm doing my panel and my family's all there and the people there. And someone in the Q&A at the very end says, hey, can you tell me what book you recommend right now? And I say, it's funny you should ask. And I hold up. You're hitting level lane. And I notice as they're asking, I see two people that are smiling at you right now in the back of the room. And I said, and I want you to know, this is what I'm reading. This is the best book. And the authors, I tell the whole story I just told you, I'm like, they're standing right behind there. And we have this like cry fest. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be on the verge of tears. I'm on the of everyone. Um, but since that time, they have become part of my family. Uh, we meet regularly for, what's it been now, half a year. I've been planning for this day for the day when their book, their amazing new book, one of the good ones, gets released into the universe. And I love that we're finally here and we're all together. That is the most important thing I have to say beside this, which is there's a green button below. Buy their book, <laughs> buy their book, okay? Because one, they're gonna sign it for you, so you have an amazing present to get. Two, there's someone you left off your Christmas and Hanukkah list, someone you screwed, someone you said, oh, I forgot them. This is how you can make it up to them. And anyone who loves books, if you're here, you're, don't just listen. I know they're going to be fun to listen to, right? But buy their book. Buy an extra one for someone. Buy one for yourself, one for someone else. Without any further ado, um, their family's watching tonight. Everyone's excited tonight. They're going to be on Late Night with Seth Meyers later tonight. But right now, we get them first. We get the scoop. Um, we love them. Let's hear it. I wish you could hear all the clapping that will happen right now. For Marika, uh, Maritza, please take it away. And congratulations. They're going to... Take it away. They're going to do some reading and we're going to have some fun. Yay. Thank Hi, you. everyone. Thank you, Brad. Also, Brad does this all the time. I made a very uh, terribly made Photoshop. I don't know if you saw it, Brad, but I have this guy open with his jacket and inside the jacket is one of the good ones and I Photoshop Brad's face onto it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so right now we are going to read a short excerpt for you from one of the good ones. It's actually at the uh, beginning of uh, the book. And we'll go ahead and jump right in, right? Yes. Okay. Chapter one. Happy. Thursday, July 26, three months, nine days since the arrest. Chicago, Illinois. She was mine before she was anyone else's. All mine. Partly mine. Now she belongs to you and them and shirts and rallies and songs and documentaries. They say she had a bright future ahead of her. She was a star whose light burned out too soon. She was going to make a difference. That's all true, but it's not the truth. Kezi was more than her brains and her grades and her voice. She was more than her future. She had a past. She was living her present. She could have been mine, should have been mine. She was my sister before she became your martyr after all. Even as I sit as still as a lion stalking her prey, inside I'm racing. My mind is buzzing with the thoughts I don't say. My heart is knocking erratically against my sternum and is always one beat away from bursting through my chest. I should be used to it, but you never get used to strangers sliding their arms over your shoulders in solidarity to apologize for something that isn't their fault. Not when Kezi being gone doesn't feel real to begin with. How can it, when I didn't get a chance to see her face one last time before they incinerated her body and put her essence in an urn? My parents are already inside the auditorium, seated in their place of honor in the front row. I will join them eventually, but not until the millisecond that I have to. When everything went down, we made an agreement. I will play along 
and be a cheap carbon copy of the daughter they lost. A constant reminder to the world that she was one of the good ones. But before the lights shine on us and cell phones are trained at our brave, heartbroken faces, I will be me, the prodigal daughter. The end. <laughs> Just kidding, it's not the end. <laughs> Just that getting like started. <laughs> Okay. Oh, right. Now you so, want to go okay. ahead. Take it away. Oh. <laughs> yes. So we wanted this to be a conversation between us and Brad, but also we wanted to check in with the audience to say hi. And also, um, we were inspired by this because one of my classmates, Daris, did this in a group uh, thing at school, which I thought was really cool. So we're going to ask a question. And you're going to, and when we say three, two, one, go, you just immediately write your answer. And when we say go, you just enter it. And we'll all see where everyone's at. Okay? Okay. Cool. So, go ahead. All righty. Describe 20, well, we'll do that. Describe 2020 in three words or less. You thought about it? All right. Three, three two, two, one, go. go. <laughs> bad. bad man full introvert mode yes we see a few in there fascinating and killer life-changing yes exhausting full of change we hear you and i'm really drawn to exhausting and full of change proof of hope calm yeah. and stormy yes i like the range that we're seeing here and i do think that it's important to acknowledge that like we were all going through something together, which is so crazy because we very much are kind of stuck in our silos often. And this past year has given most of us a very similar experience, um, even as we're kind of tucked away in our own homes. And something that Damaris says is that 2020 was kind of like a rude awakening for her. And honestly, it was a rude awake awakening for a lot of people particularly in the summer of 2020, when there was so many uprising and protests about the racial injustice in this country. And this has been a conversation for many, many years since the beginning of the founding of this country. And um, it wasn't a new topic, but for the first time, a lot more people were paying attention that maybe hadn't been so aware. So we're hoping that 2021 allows us the opportunity to continue to be introspective, as Lori points out, and that we can remember that like we still have work to do. We still have to keep on growing and thinking and just trying to be better people. All right. Well, that's all we wanted to do, Brad. <laughs> okay, you got it. No, I love it. Um, I'm totally stealing all your good ideas, by the way. So well, here we're going to do, we're going to have this conversation. Um, as we're talking, please, as they said, put your questions in the Q&A part, not in the chat part, because we're eventually going to come to your questions. Um, my first question is very simple, and, and this is going to be, we'll, we'll get to the book, but you had NPR this week. You just got off Late Night with Seth Meyers. How are you feeling? It's your first book signing that you're doing for this book. How are you feeling? Uh, I feel... It's so nuts. I, I just feel overwhelmed. I'm really excited. Um, I have hypohydrosis, so I'm showing my sisters my hands were <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but now I've calmed down a bit. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's really exciting to write something and you put all of your time, energy, sweat, tears into it, and then it's finally out into the world. But one of the good ones is a heavy book so we have to make sure that we create spaces for ourselves to be able to find joy where we can we're silly we did this little pre-order video where we did a spoof of love actually so you know it's a lot of emotions but most of all we're just happy <laughs> yeah okay happy is good okay so let's dive into it um this is a book i mean obviously you have two sisters so yeah. start with that start tell us what one of the ones is actually about um and tell us about Katie, tell us about happy Yes, so one of the good ones is about 18-year-old Kezi Smith, who is a social justice activist who dies in police custody under very mysterious circumstances. And then to commemorate their history buff sister's life, Happy and Jenny Smith decide to embark on a road trip um, in celebration of Kezi using Kezi's heirloom copy of the Negro Motor Screenbook. And, yeah. and to answer your other question about Happy and Kezi, 
Um, the story really focuses on their perspectives in the story, but they do have another sister named Jenny. And we essentially chose these three names because they originate from uh, the names of, I think it was Lot's, not Lot's Job's. Um, Job's three daughters, thank you. And in the Bible, there really aren't very many women uh, characters or people who are mentioned by name. So in this tale where we're talking about extreme loss, it really felt fitting to us, especially if you know the story of Job from the Bible where he gets persecuted by the devil because um, he was just living a really great life. And God was like, yeah, we're going to uh, I'm going to listen to the devil and put me through some tests and see if you still love me. So um, but we took that um, idea of going through extreme grief and pain and kind of molded that into the book. And the fact that we were able to use these names of these three women um, really kind of sticks out to us. And, and talk about that that moment of pain, right? Because this is obviously um, one of the good ones isn't just a good title, but it refers to a concept we have that these you know sisters are now experiencing. So talk about that for a moment. So often when a black person in particular is killed at the hands of police or some type of vigilante act by someone who thinks that they have the right to take someone's life. Um, a lot of times the conversation quickly pivots to, well, what did they do? Like, the, and then there's this investigation of trying to discover if, uh, how they were in school, if they had any behavioral issues, if they had ever smoked weed, if they were rude, <laughs> like just, there are just so many different, um, conversations that start happening that have nothing to do with the fact that someone was unjustly killed. And we wanted to point out that it, that, that, that conversation shouldn't be happening, that it's irrelevant, that there, that you shouldn't have to prove your worthiness of life. And you don't have to be seeking to be one of the good ones. Um, and often this idea of one of the good ones is moot. Um, and you could try your absolute hardest, be the fanciest person and go to the fanciest schools and have as many degrees as you want. But that isn't going to save you from the systemic issues that are embedded into this country. Yeah, and I think what struck me is, is that's a very obviously, um, that's at the core of the book, but you give us that lesson in a mystery of all things, right? This young adult mystery where you say, and let's talk about just that moment, right? Is like someone dies, Right. And when she's dead, suddenly she's the martyr, like we all as we just said, right? That's the that's the plot that drives this book. Um, but what I love is that people assume when it's a mystery that it must be fiction, you must have made it up. And obviously there's plenty of things you made up. But for you, um, can you talk about the real inspiration? Because there was a real inspiration for where this all came from, something that as you were experiencing. And I'd love I love that story you tell, so please share with everyone. Yes. So for us, this was a few years ago now, our great aunt had passed away and we were at the cemetery and we were um, looking at the mausoleum wall of the names of other people who have passed away. And as we were looking through all of the names, we came across one that we recognized and it was Trayvon Martin's name. And it just was so jarring because his Miami was our Miami. He went to a school that our youngest sister went, attended at one point in time, although at different times. And it just was, um, you know, if you had been walking with, uh, you know, coverings over your eyes or thinking that the world was this beautiful place, what happened to Trayvon Martin totally ripped that uh, veil, if you will, from you, from your eyes to allow you to really see the world for what it is. And um, that really stuck with us. And we decided to kind of focus more on the family members who are left behind when these horrible acts of violence occur against black people because when the media is going about its business breaking down the you know character of the person who was killed you still have to contend with the fact that this person had a mom a dad a brother a sister a lover a friend whoever in a community of people who are then left to move on without them so we decided to um, tackle that in our book but looking specifically through the lens of um, these sisters to allow us to have this conversation about race because there's no way for you to look at what's happening in the country today uh, in regards to racial injustice without knowing the past. So we were able to incorporate that and a few things um, in this book. I also just love it because it lets you like, for your aunt, like it makes you forever be like, she's looking out for you, man. She showed you exactly where to look that day, which gave yeah. you a whole book, which is incredible. Um, yeah. 
also just the timing of it, right? So you 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 see this, right? You see the grave. You know what's going on. This is not, you know, Black Lives Matter is not like, oh, this happened. I know, you know, for many people, it's like, oh, that happened in 2020. You know, like, but no, that's been happening for centuries. Um, and I, I actually always wonder. So you're working on this book. This is two years of your life, and then 2020 hits. And how does it feel when you're in the middle of this? You know, I know I was once doing a book on the presidency and then a presidential scandal came and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm now fighting with reality. You know, am I, but you had this odd, amazing, beautiful opportunity where you're writing and rendering as history is happening. Can you talk about how, what that's like as a writer where, you know, how much did, what was, it, and maybe you were all done. I actually don't even know. Were you, you know, were you all done when that all happened or were you like, no, now we have to let, you know, we have some more stuff to inform the story of? At the point of the summer of 2020, we were done with the story, but it was incredibly disconcerting to see that something that we had just finished was happening all around us. It was insane to see. And even um, as we were sending out or like sending our editor, Natasha, the like most final edits and everything to her, um, we had to go back and add names of individuals like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, and um, even more, who were alive when we had had when we had first had the idea for this book, when we first sold the idea, when we sat down and wrote it, and now they were gone, and it was for the same reasons that we that 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 led us to write the book in the first place. So it was demoralizing, but at the same time, like our feelings are nothing compared to the loved ones of these individuals who now are missing a piece of their heart moving forward and have to continue to like fight and, and rise up. And there actually is this um, uh, reading of uh, Tony or, or writing that Toni Morrison wrote about where she said that she felt kind of like stuck and, and very sad and didn't want to write. But then she realized that like writing could be an opportunity for her to pursue her activism and for her to speak up in a way that felt true to her. And I have really kept that close to my heart in this period. Like one of the good ones is an opportunity um, to have people see experiences that they know per personally and closely, but then also it can be, um, as a scholar says, uh, a window for other individuals to look into and see the experiences of others. Yeah, I mean, and what struck me, um, I will say, Mike, I read this quote by you, and I'm going to surprise you with it. Um, but you wrote this, you said this, it says, as a black author, I have to read here, it says, there are times when you have this desire to make sure that you are helping to teach just as you are entertaining. That's a different responsibility than I think many people feel. And can you talk, because you're, you, as far as I'm concerned, you're, you're, I know it's fiction and I know it's, you know, this young adult and they have the mystery, but I feel like you're rendering history in real time. Um, and can you talk about exactly what that feels like? Yes. So sometimes because there are so few books available about black folks and it's starting to change, but it's in my opinion, not changing facts enough. You end up as a black author, a black writer, you end up feeling like you have to fill the gap for what should have already existed in the literary space. So you sit down to write your story and you have your idea, but then you have to worry about because of the lack of representation that someone will read this book and think this then becomes the definitive story of black women or Dear Haiti Love Elaine becomes the definitive story about a Haitian American girl. When it's not the case, it's just a fictional story that might have elements of reality in it, but it's completely rooted in fiction. But um, it weighs heavily on you. Sometimes it can, uh, really frees you in the moment when it comes to write because that is a very heavy burden to bear. If you think I'm just going to write so I can make money, haha, -ha, authors you don't make money until you get really big at writing author. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think, oh, I'm gonna do this to make money and it's gonna really work out the way that it needs to, like you are going to be rudely uh, awakened really. And then you go through that process and you need to be able to navigate those feelings of, understanding that there is a lack of representation, but not letting that stifle your creativity, but then also acknowledging that. So it's a it's a juggling act. And there are times when I'm leaning more into the education side or the uh, entertainment side, but 
all in all, I hope that when people read our books, that if they come across something that they don't know about, that they then go and research it. Because there are things that we included in the story that we totally made up. So if you're taking this as like, okay, this is an you know, auto, not a writer, but like a, a, a nonfiction account, then you will see that we have revised history in certain places. But hopefully it will just spark that curiosity and allow people to learn so many of the things that we don't learn in school or growing up in school, going to school. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, and, and by the way, before we even get to that, because I do want to, I want to hit that history part, but I do want to say those are very heavy topics. What I love, and now you know, again, because I know you so well, you are, um, you are both so light, and, and I mean that in the sense of, of you are, you are, like a breath of fresh air. I mean, you are just like if some people are just heavy and down, you are just like you bring sunshine and. When you let that light in, you let it into all of us. And what, what struck me in the book is you're dealing with these very heavy topics, these very heavy moments in history. It's all happening around us. But oddly, what you celebrate in this book and is not the depressing idea of, oh, oh we martyr people who die and we make people, you know, some people more valuable, valuable than others, but as you bring a complexity to it. And that, to me, is very hopeful. So I, I love that you bring that, and that lightness is the wrong word, but like you bring that level of hope. So. Fantastic. Okay, but let's talk about the history, um, because as you said, major history in this book. Um, I'm a huge lover of all the history that was in there. Let's talk. I know the Green Book, the, the famous the Negro Motorist Green Book. Let's talk about that and how you used it. And and did you even did you know about that one? Did you? I know there was some. I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna go on to the other stuff after. But uh, please tell everyone about that. Yes. So Mika likes to point out that she knew about the Green Book before I did, <laughs> but and I don't know what she learned about it. Uh, Moses, it's just, I just knew it. <laughs> but I remember um, watching the trailer. Well, I just ended up reading about it somewhere, like going down a rabbit hole on Wikipedia. And I was like, whoa, there was this book, like a yellow pages that black people would use to travel around the United States safely. And it wasn't surprising that such an artifact would have to exist in this right. country. But it was still noteworthy for me to know that it did in fact exist. So we actually were immediately inspired by like writing a story, like something about some characters going on a road trip maybe, or incorporating um, parts of the past into the present, which we do weave into this story. And um, we ended up like having so many different uh, facets of the story kind of come together and the Green Book was very much an anchor for us because we used it as um, a guide for characters who had very strong connections to our main characters in the present, like their ancestors or, or um, friends of the family who had used the Green Book and had been in certain places that the characters in the present were going into. So it was really also very fun to come across random tidbits of information as we were um, doing the research for the story. So the Green Book has been awesome. And then it's not just a Green Book, you also have the Hanging, let's talk about the hanging Bridge, Sundown Towns. I'd never heard of either of those things. Yeah. Um, please. Yeah. Um, I didn't know, so I'm sure there are people out there, please talk about them. Yes. So essentially when we get started with the story, we know that there's gonna be a lot of research involved. I didn't want to say we get started with the story. This is only our second book, but <laughs> it's, it seems that we are, it, seems to be incorporating uh, history in our books, but we will start and do like an overall uh, search, if you will. And it was really helpful for us. We are still library girls at heart. Um, we were able to rely on the New York Public Library. They, the Schomburg Center has this really cool interactive uh, website that allows you to basically map your own trip using the Negro Motorist Green Book as your guide. So we tapped into that and we, um, essentially map the road trip that our characters go on from Chicago to Los Angeles using the website and other websites that we found along the way. And then we decided to make some, um, uh, you know, take some creative license and change the name of certain cities to really show that it's not really about a specific city. This could be anywhere USA, South, Midwest, North, Northeast, wherever. Um, but it was really just to show that honestly across this country, there have been places where it hasn't been safe for black folks to exist. So in sundown towns in particular, it's just what the name sounds like. As soon as the sun went down, if you were a black person, you had to be out of that town. And if you weren't, terrible things could happen to you. And they had places like the Hanging Bridge, which is 
totally wild to think about that folks would go and watch someone's life be taken and take pictures and create postcards. And it's, 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 um, it's honestly, it's disgusting and it turns your stomach. And as we were going through this process of reading it, we didn't really go into the, the nitty gritty of all of that within our story because um, that's something that we would want somebody to research on their own. We didn't really want to delve into that on the page per se, but we do mention it peripherally because of things that have happened to the ancestors of our characters. But then we also found some really cool um, things as well that we didn't know. So for instance, like there was a part where Maritza was uh, researching something and she had to look, uh, when were seatbelts invented? You know, when we have our characters in the 1930s and 40s, did they go and put their seatbelt on? Or if somebody hopped into the pool after they just got a perm in their hair, are they worried about chlorine? And I found out this really cool thing about this woman named um, Stagecoach Mary. If you don't know about her, look her up. She is a total badass. Okay, so a story about Stagecoach Mary. I need to hear about Stagecoach Mary. She's not <laughs> awesome, really. The so, fact that her name is Stagecoach. Yes. So Stagecoach Mary essentially was the first black woman to hold a role in what we consider the US Postal Service today. But before that, she was a nun and she was a part of a convent. And she ended up getting kicked out of the convent because she got into a disagreement with one of the um, the, the, the people who helped out on the, the land of the convent. And they basically pulled guns on each other and they were just like, this woman needs to go. And she was a, a queer woman out here living her life. I just think of this, of like this woman, a black woman in the early 1900s, wielding a gun, horseback riding across the United States, delivering mail after being a drinking, smoking, gun-toting uh, nun. Nun, it's just... <laughs> Google her. <laughs> yes, amazing. Um, okay, so now the book is obviously filled with these kind of, I think, beautiful and also really hard callbacks in history. I want to get and use this time to go into some of your history. Okay, so I want to go to the way back machine, especially in North Miami Beach, especially at Oral High School. This is a local crowd you're talking to. I know it's a national crowd too. Everyone's watching. No pressure. But tell us, I want to hear from you, and, I, and we're going to get to how you write together. I promise we'll get to all that. But I want to know who you were back then, when when you were in high school, who each of you were, and and you know, and maybe it's just like who you were, maybe you still are, and who you were, and who you're not anymore. But I'd love to hear about your history because I think when you come to these events, it's fine to hear about the book, and we're going to get all that. But I, I think people, I want them to know how amazing you are. Yes. Ooh, who was I? Oh. By the way, you both, wait, when I asked that, you both completely blushed. You both were like, oh, oh crap, that was not on the game. No one. No one. <laughs> um, okay, so me in high, okay, so I think to understand me in high school, you have to understand me in middle school. <laughs> and middle school is full of the worst human beings on earth. Yes. It's that very specific group of people who are going through puberty and don't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> so I had to wear a back brace because I had scoliosis for three years in middle school. So I was uh, wearing like really big clothes. Billie Eilish makes it look cool, makes it look cool now, but it was not cool then. <laughs> and um, I was incredibly shy, had really bad acne, which I then took Accutane for in high school. And <laughs> Maria Benora is here. Oh, Maria. <laughs> um, so I was just really quiet and read a lot. And um, I did speech and debate in high school and <laughs> yeah and um, I uh, was part of the drama club as well and I was able to like talk like do like a public speaking type of thing but like social situations were incredibly awkward for me and um, yes thank you for traumatizing me back <laughs> no, I mean, you just painted like that's like the the Oliver Twist of like modern day junior high school. Oh, he was this back brace girl. Really, like you are literally one step away. If this was an eighties movie, from pulling your glasses off and letting your hair go down. I mean, it's, okay. So I got your picture. I got your picture. Maika, tell us. Give us your. Uh, so okay, so me in high school, I okay, so I'm the oldest of the four of us, right? And I was the one who would always talk back to my parents. I was a total pain in the ass. She was <laughs> like, I uh, there's a book uh, by Elizabeth Acevedo called The Poet X, and the main character's name is Siomara. If you read that book and you make her Haitian American, that is me. I am her. Growing up in a strict Haitian household, very religious. Um, 
figuring out yourself, um, all of these things. So it, and it's funny though, because I still had anxiety and I was nervous all the time. So some people, if they didn't know me, they would think, oh, she's stuck up. She doesn't talk to anyone. I'm like, that's because I'm terrified. And you don't know that my hands are sweating. <laughs> so I definitely had to be able to navigate that. And, and I, oh, um, I used to eat lunch in the bathroom <laughs> because I did not like being around people. Yes, I just, I didn't Wow, really you're like just playing top this now with junior high awkwardness. I love that. <laughs> I didn't really lunch in the bathroom, that is so unsanitary. I know, <laughs> especially in a high school, let me tell you, okay? Oh no, because they're known for their clean bathrooms in the high school, oh yeah. <laughs> it was basically, if the library was closed, I just would go hide in there, but okay, I- When you were in the library, did they have those, I forget what's the NMB library, did they have the spray painted walls there or no? Or maybe that's the junior high school library I'm thinking about. Uh, it, might, it, might be, it might be JFK, it might be JFK. I think yeah, JFK. okay. That's okay. I don't know if that's for sure. <laughs> yes, but um, but yeah, no, so it was, it was totally like, I just, had a lot of nerves and trying to navigate, you know, my emotions. And then I would say as time progressed, I came into my own, talked back to my parents more. Sorry, mom and dad. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but both readers, both of you were readers. Total yes. readers, yes. How was your escape? And what kind of book, what, what, what were you reading back then? What was the book that defined you if I found you in junior high school or high school? Uh, well, first, probably Harry Potter. Um, I am <laughs> yeah. a proud member of Ravenclaw. Okay. Ravenclaw! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Oh, I'm so excited about this. Yes, yeah. Yes, but you know, it, it's um, it's really interesting now because some of the books that we love when we were growing up, like we totally love them. And then we uh, start to meet authors or hear from them and we're like, oh, you're not a great person. So that always makes it a little, <laughs> a little touch and go there. But, uh, but yeah, I was reading a lot of things I shouldn't have been reading. I was reading romance novels and adult romance novels. So there were, and I see somebody wrote, Eric Jerome Dickey, he passed away, I think today, I think they said that. So he died. Um, yes, yeah. we oh, are. No, I didn't know that. Yes. Oh my gosh, I remember being on tour when he was there. We would like go, the, oh my gosh. Yes, yes. For COVID? I, I don't know, I don't know. Gosh, okay. Yes, but huh? it, reading all of these, um, inappropriate books really for somebody at our age at the time but we saw ourselves in these characters and we were able to um you know uh, commiserate with some of the things that they were going through but it would have been really great for us to um it would have been great for us to see characters who look like us or who had our experiences because even though we didn't share the identities of some of the folks that we were reading about we still were able to create that meaning and i hope that you know even if you're not a young black girl or a young black uh, queer girl that if you come across one of the good ones you're like i could still read this because this is a human being that i can see similarities in yeah and, and listen i think you know uh, one of my favorite harry just to stay on your harry potter point um, i take no credit for this someone said it and i just loved it and they said it was the guy who actually did the covers for the new reissues of harry potter and he said he'd never read harry potter but they wanted him to do the art and so he went back and read all of them in modern time like now not even when we read them when we were younger and um, he said he understood in that moment that what the books were really about was about how to deal with an authoritarian regime, that these kids were told over and over again, whether it was by Pettigrew or whether by Voldemort or whether by the Ministry of Magic, over and over that the system is going to fail you. It's corrupt. It's horrible. It's run by these like adults that are monsters. But he realized in that moment that he had complete faith in the future because it was in the hands of these amazing kids who are armed with that belief. And there are millions of kids like you, you know, Maritza, like who are armed with this belief now that they can take on the world and that they're gonna beat back all this evil with goodness and kindness. So I love that. I, and I love that what you're doing now and you'll do in this book is do that for other kids out there, um, you know, whether they're, you know, whatever version they are, even uh, even us bald ones, we have stuff in here, right? Like, I mean, those are, you're going to make a difference to people um, in ways that and arm them. You're going to give them this armor that they need at that time. It says you need them. Okay. Um, now, okay. From history to the future, where do you see yourselves in 10 years, your dreams as authors, 10 years from now, you got to say it wherever it is. You got to dream it. You got to, I mean, to live it, you got to dream it. So, so where do you, well, I'll you say 10 years yeah. from today together and we can see where you are. Oh my gosh. Okay. 10 years from now, I want you, can you can take whatever you want, but take the future. Yeah, like continue to write books with Mika <laughs> and write lots of different age groups 
um, and like have a website like yours that says <laughs> for adults and for kids, you know, because yes. we are just so wide, uh, wide ranging. And just to like have a community of readers out there who are excited for our works and actually look forward to reading what we have to say um, and that we continue to say things that feel true to us and then also um, other people can see themselves with. Yeah. But we just want to keep selling books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, there is uh, an old proverb by somebody who used to be okay, but it's totally flip it out. But a real G's move in silence like lasagna. So uh, I don't want to say <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> everything, but we have really big dreams for ourselves because uh, you know we've, we've honestly we've come a really long way, and uh, I'm just really excited to see what will what the future will hold. And I think that even anything that we dream up will not be big enough. That's what I want for us. That, we that can is what I want to hear. I love that. Yes, <laughs> that's right. You cannot even say because it it's so. It's so <laughs> Okay, now the question everyone does want to know, and everyone asked me, all my friends were texting me today, how do you physically write together? And not just physically write together, because I know you can do without murdering each other. That is the key question. You can I understand people can do, but how do you do without murdering each other? Ooh, it's very, very hard. <laughs> so what we do is okay, so, uh what we do is we sit down and we have a meeting where we insult each other and also <laughs> plan out an outline so we do that for some time and we'll end up like typing up like a 15 20 page outline of just what we want to happen in the story and, and is that just for that's not for that's for the whole book yeah. Whole book. Okay. Yeah. so um we have a pretty clear idea of what we want to happen but then we still leave enough space for like the spirit to move us or whatever and then we just kind of jump in. We write pretty chronologically, unless there's a section that's really hard to write and we're just avoiding it. Yes. But we write um, pretty much in order. And um, I can like write this chapter and maybe you can write this chapter or I'll do this chunk of text and then Mika will do another chunk of text. And then the other person will go in and read what the other person has written and do any necessary edits and then like add any extra spice to make the uh, final work feel like it's like one voice. But we will say that um, uh, Malika and I and our two younger sisters, Jessica and Lydian, have very similar sensibilities anyway, probably yeah. because we were stuck in the house together for so long. <laughs> so we just kind of share one large brain and um, it, it, it's pretty easy. And even like for one of the good ones, like we were pretty, I don't know, <laughs> Natasha's not here. here. She was, was, yeah, <laughs> our editor. <laughs> she was, but I think we were pretty good with the deadline. Like, we She's on mute. We could say whatever we want about it. Well, listen to her. <laughs> but we worked pretty, like, pretty del diligently. And, like, I, I don't know. We, we followed deadlines. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, I love you, but what I love, and I, and I say this about you in life, is you are, and I can never have this no matter how hard I try. I mean, I have my sister who I love and adore. But she doesn't want to write. She doesn't care about that. But you have a... um. Siblings have you have a harmony. You're a chorus. You yeah. are a chorus. I yeah, see yeah. when you talk. I see when you you know when we when we talk all the time. And I wonder, can you even? I know you know your parts, but can you even now? If I if I took maybe an older book, if I took Dear Haiti Love Elaine, and I brought it to you, could you tell which is yours and which is? Can you? Yeah, uh, Mika's like I got to talk right now. <laughs> There is a part in Dear Haiti Love Elaine, till this day, to this day, <laughs> I say I wrote it, I know I wrote it, and Marissa okay. insists that she that wrote it. That's, right. that's not a fight, that's a good sign, right? That's <laughs> you think that you actually think you're the other's voice, which is beautiful. <laughs> and that's the thing, that you have a chorus, it's beautiful. Okay, we are hitting, okay, we're hitting, oh, wait, I got one more question, wait, I'm gonna, I promise then, I'm gonna, I promise right now, we got one minute. Okay. Um, you're on your fit. You know, I found out today, this is what I want the audience to know. I found out today that you, because I am so absurdly older than you, but you somehow, by and maybe this is why we're friends, <laughs> you have watched so much old crappy 80s television. And, you, and I'll tell you where I came up. You sent me a Sanford and Son gif, and I wrote back to you and was like, you don't even know what that show is. Yeah. And then you schooled me and said, we did because we didn't have cable and we had to watch all these old crappy shows, which I love it, love you for. But you're on the set of your favorite show of all time. Okay, pick like whatever it is. It could be old, it could be new, it could be anything. Okay. And it's the last episode, and the director comes and says to you, "You can take anything you want." Ooh. 
What do you take? Oh, oh my man. God. Oh, man. I know what I want to do. Okay. You know already. Okay, I want to hear. What, what do you know? I want to take the, um, I want to take Fraser's dad's couch. <laughs> Wow. Yes. She's obsessed with Fraser. It's a problem. Really? Martin's couch. <laughs> and like reupholster it into like pillows and like why would you reupholster it then it's not his couch anymore? The back of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm she sure would do enough. what Fraser did, learn the story again. And then right. okay, that's fair. Mika, what do you what do you got? Um, oh gosh, I really I can't think of anything. I'm trying. Um, what's sticking out to me? What's sticking out to me? What would I take? You're gonna think of it in five minutes when you stop thinking okay. about. It. We're gonna I'm, go gonna say, I'm gonna say Black Panther, the the staff from the Dora Milaje because that's you know. a far more sensible. I make sense to me. I would be like, yes, take like Captain America's shield. Take something. <laughs> like that. Oh no, I take Chris Evans. <laughs> that's that's gonna take. Think out of the box. I love that. Um, okay, we're gonna go to everyone's questions and answers. Okay. Um, and I'm just now I'm scrolling through unless his books and books through the I'm going to do this. Ready? Uh, you heard a little bit, but I know you said you chose the characters' names. Um, this is by Becca. And I know you spoke about the biblical ones, the main three. Talk about how you choose the other ones. Do you pick friends? you pick family? People you hate? People you love? Do you kill the people that you hate? Do you show love to the people you love? <laughs> hmm. Well, I think the names sometimes are just like, this sounds good, and we choose it. Sometimes Maritza is like, I want every character's name to begin with the letter A. And then I'm like, no, that's going to get confusing. <laughs> but we actually have, well, I won't say the name, but uh, there's a character in the book who is a teacher who basically was like, and if you went to NMB, do not put the person's name. I'm just throwing that out. <laughs> but Wait, was, a was it a teacher that NMB? I will text you separately. Okay, I want to hear that. That's going to be the story of the night. Everyone's going to miss it but me. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a teacher who basically, he was, I don't even know if I should. Well, well, he was a history teacher at the time, and one of my one of our sisters was in the class, and he was basically saying, "Oh, slavery wasn't that bad because the slaves had Christmas off." So we actually took that from real life and put that into one of the good ones. And yeah, Maria, keep that zip, 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 zip. We'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. But uh, yeah, and uh, Kenzie totally schools him in the book. So <laughs> okay, here's um here's one from Christina. I feel that both of your novels push barriers and bend genre, which is wonderful. Is this something you've set out to do from the beginning or do you outline plan and sort of grow once you sit down to write them? That's how much is on purpose and how much you like, this is just the way we are. So I think it's, okay, so for Dear Haney Love Elaine, it was definitely on purpose. Like we set out to write an epistolary novel and we had lots of like text messages and letters and a police report and uh, blog posts and lots of different things. So writing a, a, a story using so many different um, pieces of media really kind of pushed us as storytellers. <laughs> but um, I, I think we did continue to do that in uh, one of the good ones, because even for one of the good ones, we were like, yeah, we're writing a, a straight story. This is it. Like, this is going to be the opposite, you know? <laughs> but then we realized that, like, we really wanted to tap into that historical element of the Green Book and, like, incorporate characters from the past. And um, we definitely did that. So we have lots of, like, jumping into the past and moving into the um, into the forward, into the future or into the, the present day. So yeah, uh, hopefully we keep pushing ourselves intentionally, but I think a lot of it ends up being um, kind of as we write and uh, we figure out what we want to do. I will say that um, I I think as authors, we always want to sound like we're so smart and we're all in control and we go, oh, I did all that on purpose. Everything I intend is right there. But I do think you are that next generation. You know, when, when I started writing, you wrote thrillers and then you wrote thriller and you were a thriller writer. You wrote romance, you wrote a romance writer. And and I hope, you know, the one thing is maybe short attention span, but I'd love to be able to kind of try something different. It would be like if I said to you, you can you can only watch superhero movies. Oh, you love them? You can only watch them the rest of your life. Right. Very soon you want to put a gun to your head because you're like, that's all. And I love the fact that you're pushing with each book. And I know it's just two, but I even see in your writing that, and I've read your article, you know, the article you've published, like you are pushing it and you're finding your voice, you're finding who you are. And I love the fact that you've had this success so young that you're only going to grow. And I can't wait to see what you bring us. That's where your dream is going to be big in a way that you can't anticipate because you're going to take on the world. Okay, this is the one from Christina. It says the cover is so beautiful, which it is, 
Are you able to weigh in at all during the cover process? Or, yeah, totally up with the selling. Remember, buy your book now. You like it. Don't click off. Um, uh, I'm going to save something for you at the end, by the way, to, so stick around. Um, are you able to weigh in at all during the cover process, or does the publisher send it to you once it's final? Which I read as, how nice is your editor? Let's talk about it. Yes. <laughs> Well, Tucker is really awesome. He is. Yes. And for Dear Haiti Love Elaine and one of the good ones, um, Tasha was like, oh, what do you envision on this envision on this cover? And me and Maritza being the you know type A folks that we are, we're like, we're gonna make a Pinterest board. So we basically create a Pinterest board of what the characters look like, their hair, um, down to like skin tone. We're like very intentional. We're like, oh, if you can incorporate the green as a nod to the Negro Motors green book. And we're just like, okay, do your thing. And we even talk like the hair texture, like you can see the, the the curls and you see that pattern? Do you see that? The widow's peak, the braids, the press. I mean, yeah. So, uh, and big Gigi, up to Tasha and Gigi, Gigi Lau. Yes. She really just takes what seems like kind of like a big uh, <laughs> screaming, not screaming, but just like, this is what we want. <laughs> then she really turns it into something that's cohesive and beautiful. Yeah. And then she finds these artists who are like so talented, like Rochelle Baker, yeah. who can create something like this. And so make, good. Yeah, so good. it's awesome. <laughs> you have to get, you have to ask her to do a print for you. Um, that you can, like, cause, oh, We have one, Brittany can it out for us already. It's huge, like the Dear Haiti one. No, too. that is what I want. Yes, I want to be huge. <laughs> it's like a blanket you can sleep in. Um, okay, here's one from Tara. It says, how much of your own relationship is reflected in your character? Um, are there any moments in the book based on real events, moments and events? I know you talked about some, but I do, I do really uh, let you answer the question, but also talk about, you know, in this book, interestingly, you have one character who's like, the quote unquote good one, and you have the sullen kind of like the angry one. The, it, and, and how much does I'll just add to this? Please talk about, you know, are these two the two sisters that we see up front, and obviously the third who comes, but um, are you working out your own stuff here as well? <laughs> well I don't know. Oh, wait, did you answer that question? We try to bounce back. Sorry, I lost track of who spoke last. <laughs> You're so nice. Look at that. <laughs> you see, by the way, I want to point that out for everyone. They just literally have the whole time for. 52 minutes have been literally being like your turn, then my turn. And you're they are going us. My sister and I would be like elbowing each other out of the way. And, talking, and you, you just the whole time were being nice. So that deserves more books being bought for time. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's our relationship per se. I think, yeah, somewhat Christy said it's such a sister thing. Yes. So when we were growing up, our mom, if she had one stick of gum, she wouldn't just give it to one of us. She would break that one stick of gum into four pieces so that all four of us could share. So it still persists today. But um, I would say that our sister, we're really close with our sister. So Mertz and I clearly were close, but our two younger sisters, Jessica and Lydia, and like we love each other. We're each other's biggest fans. It's uh, probably not healthy. I'm sure people are from outside looking at like they like each other a lot, but we, just, we really do. And um. Uh, but of course, we have moments where we're just like uh, uh, annoying each other or we'll just be beefing with each other. I remember last year when we were on the book tour for Dear Haiti Love Lane, like Maritza and I were like arguing on the plane and then we get off and we're like with the person who's guiding us around. We're like, hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you end up knowing how to like navigate that. But I don't I wouldn't say it was necessarily our relationship, but maybe it's or, you know. that feeling of. Because like sometimes you do get into arguments or you do feel like out of the group of the four of us that you're the odd one out or the black sheep. And we really dug deep and tried to incorporate those feelings into one of the good ones, especially with Happy, because she really does feel like she is kind of, uh, I don't know the saying, but she is just kind of off in a corner where, and, and Kezi and Jenny are the best of friends and having lunch and stuff. And you there, there's no one out there who always 100% feels like they're part of a group. Yeah. Um, and so we really just try to amplify those feelings. Yeah. And we basically have uh, four different text messages where we leave the sister we're talking crap about off so that way we can feel like that girl, terrible. And then we have all four of us. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's also for birthdays. Yes. So. Okay. Well, we, I'm going to keep this. I promise I will keep uh, this running on time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, on behalf of everyone who tuned in tonight, thank you for doing such an amazing job. Um, I'm going to let you have the final word, but I will take this one before, which is simply to say to everyone out there, when, and I, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to this kickoff event. Make sure you watch them. I hope I'm pointing the right way on everyone's screen. Um, 
they're going to be on late night with Seth Meyers tonight and they're going to crush it. And, but most important, when you, when you buy a book, you vote, you vote, especially tonight on election night. Right. And you vote. And I know it's really easy to stay at home. I know it's really easy to go to, you know, the online thing and click the button and it comes right to your house. But places like books and books are key vital parts of this community. I believe it. And I say it every time they are the best bookstore in the entire country. I've been to almost all of them. There is nothing like this. So, Please click the green button, order their book. They're going to sign it for you. Order a second one to give to a friend. You're helping book from book. You're helping these amazing sisters. You're helping everyone tonight. Um, and I will just say, Maika um, and Maritza, like, I love you. I'm so proud of you being this amazing, wonderful launch. Take it away and you can say thank you, but thank you to everybody here and thanks to Books and Books for hosting us all. Thank you for your excellent moderating, Brad. Thank you so much for always supporting us. And congratulations again to you, Mike and Maritza. We're so thrilled to be your like local indie bookstore and especially me to be able to Yay, to be able to be part of events like this and have signed books and call you friends. And we I love the book. It's amazing. It's wonderful. I'm so excited for what you have next and all of Side Books and Books are as well. So have a good night, everyone. And I'm going to watch Seth later. Yay! Yeah. Watch Seth. Watch Seth.